My first question uh, would be to tell me when and where were you born? When and where I was born? Yes, sir. I was born near my mother. <laughs> <laughs> All right. When I was born, August 4th, 1925. Okay. And, and where was that? In the Bronx, New York. Um, and could you tell me a bit about? Could you tell me a bit about growing up in the twenties and thirties? How it was growing up? It was a lot of fun. We would play in the street. Nobody had a gun. We would we would, we had a, a round ball. We called it a spalding. We played punch ball, spit ball. We all had fun, and there was no violence. No one was killing. There was nothing like that in my. Your, but your mother said, go out and play. And we went out and we played in the street. Hmm. And what occupations did your parents have? What? What jobs did your parents have? What, what job? What jobs? Yes. Did Your parents. Oh, my parents. What, what job did my father have? He sold paper products to, uh, uh, to butchers and to groceries. The groceries needed paper bags to put stuff in. And he, he had, a, had a place where he had all the paper bags and, and he would have a, a truck deliver them. I would, I and someone else would get orders from the stores. We go into a, a, a grocery store, and you need number three bags. That's small. Number five, number eight, and all different size bags. And we would take orders, and we would tell them what they have to pay. And then a truck would deliver it to them, and I would get a commission from from uh, where it from where they came from. Uh, so that was nice. And how was it? Did the Great Depression affect? Um, uh, Twenty nine. Yes. I was only four years old, so I don't remember. Anything. Okay. Um, but I I do know this. We always had food on the table. Okay. Hmm. How my father managed, I don't know. I was a little kid, but I know we we always had food. Um, and could you tell me where were you uh, when the Pearl Harbor attack occurred? Now, this is going to sound terrible to you. I'm very happy about Pearl Harbor. Now, why? Why was I happy about Pearl Harbor where all those poor people got killed? Because England was being attacked by Germany, and they wanted us to help them with some tanks, and we would not sell them anything. We would not help them in any way. But when Pearl Harbor came, then we had to get involved, and we helped England, and we helped defeat Hitler, who, who was terrible, some terrible stories about that. So you already opposed the war before Pearl Harbor? Did I oppose the war before Pearl Harbor? It's a good question. Uh, I was against it, but, but not, not vehemently. I didn't realize how serious it could have been and how, how serious it got. I didn't realize the potential seriousness. Hmm. And did what led you to enlist, or were you drafted? What? what why did, did you enlist, or were you drafted? I, drew, I enlisted. My number was 12226653. If 
that there starts with a loan shows that I am, that's an enlisted number. I was 18 and two months when I was in the army, October. And what led you to enlist? What led me to enlist? Because I felt it was important to stop this man, Hitler. And you were fresh out of high school, right? I was just out of high school. I, I guess so. Could you tell me about the day you enlisted? The day I enlisted, let me see. I, I, I can't. I went into this place and I just signed my papers. I, and I got dog tags. I, still, I have a copy of my dog tags. If you want to see them. Um... Well, uh, later, I think I would like to see them. Um, you would? Yes, but, but later, later. Don't worry about that right now. Um, okay, so what branch did you choose and why? Oh, well, well, that's a good question. Did I choose the infantry? Oh, I, I don't think I chose. Oh. I guess I chose the infantry because I, I, I was very young. And I didn't know how to, I wasn't going to learn how to fly an airplane or a tank. So uh, the infantry was the one who got a rifle, got an M1, and you marched. And then you, you just, uh, you were a whole your battalion. Yeah, that's the, I'm just thinking what you call it. Yeah. And... Could you tell me a bit about training? About what? Your, your training. By training. Yeah, infantry training. They put you through all kinds of simulated attacks. You had to crawl in mud. Uh, and it was, uh, they shot fake bullets over your head. I mean, if you lifted your head, it wouldn't hurt you really. But it was to make you crawl in mud with your rifle and keeping your rifle out of the mud so it could still work. And uh, that was one of the training. And then, of course, uh, marching. Uh, I marched with a nine-pound uh, pack on my back of, of things that you needed. And a nine-mile march that was part of the training I went through, um, and climbing over different things. I don't remember everything, you know. It's a, a many years ago. Um, do you have any f funny stories from training that you could tell me? Any stories? Yeah. I'm trying, <laughs> trying to think. It was dangerous. I, I only have a funny story. I, I don't want. I don't want to tell you. It's, it's, it's a funny story. But uh, what can I tell you? Don't worry. You can tell me whatever story you you have. <laughs> this was funny. You know, when we were out there. We, sometimes when we were in a place where we were resting and there were no toilets, so they would dig a trench and, and, and we would straddle over the trench and that was our toilet. And this poor guy, you know, we ate, we ate out of mess kits. We carried a, a metal mess kit where we would get food and so on, and he dropped his mess kit in. <laughs> that's, that's the story I remember. Anyway. Thank you for telling me this. Um, and were you uh, specialized in anything specifically? Was I specialized? No. I was just in infantry, which meant I marched, I, I, I carried things on my back backpack and and did what uh, the battalion commander said 
And, and everybody hit the ground. Okay, up, let's march forward. And, and we marched. I just paid, did what I was told. I was part of a company, K company. And then they put me into the intelligence and required INR intelligence and reconnaissance. This is the stupidest thing. I had a very high IQ. So every battalion had what they called an intelligence and reconnaissance section. It was six men, just six men and a sergeant. And what was their job? The intelligence and reconnaissance. Reconnaissance meant to send you out on patrol into the enemy's area and because you were smart <laughs> you would learn what's going on and then you'd come back well that's the stupidest thing in the world because it was dangerous and thank god they never sent us over that we're going to but then they sent people from k company and one guy whom i liked very much never came back he got killed I remember him I felt so badly but it would have been me maybe hmm. anyway could you tell me how you kept in contact with your family throughout your training how I did what how you kept in contact with your family throughout your training just sending the letters and they were all all the letters had to be read by a certain part to see things that was <coughs> giving secrets away so they would scratch it out. The letters were checked and approved uh, and parts of it that were secretive were erased by the those who checked all the letters. And how often would he write home? What? How often would he write home? I really don't know. A few times a week. Um, could you tell me about um, shipping overseas? Hey, you know, I, you know, I had a brother too. Uh, uh, Isaac told me. Yes. All right. All right. So uh, when shipping overseas, uh, when Pearl Harbor came, and so we had to go overseas. Oh, I, I, I landed in La Havre, France, I remember. And then I went into a cattle car. And they, where did the cattle car take us? I don't remember exactly where. Hmm. To the front line to fight. And what was the ship like? Was it very crowded on board? On the ship? Yes. Going, going overseas? Yes. It was, it was enough. We, you, you slept in tears. In other words, they, you climbed up. There was two, two people above you. One, two, three. Three decks. And, and the ocean was rough. And all I ate was cookies <laughs> because when you went into the mess hall, the, <laughs> your plate would move from from one end to the other because the ocean was rough. So I couldn't handle that. So I just got on my little cot up there. I got a case of butter, butter cookies, butter, butter chip cookies, the biscuit. And that's what I lived on for for the time it took overseas. Oh, and it was all right. I wasn't hungry. And what were your first impressions of France um, when you got there? Of uh, France? Yes. Uh, well, I didn't feel I was. In France or anywhere, I thought I was in combat. I was in, in a war. 
I didn't think of the fact that it was what country it was or anything. I, I just felt I had to be care, careful and lucky. Do you remember like the overall sentiment of your regiment before, right before going into combat? Say that again? Do you remember the sentiment of the regiment before going into combat? The, the 343rd Infantry Division. K, uh, well, I wasn't in K Company, but I was a, there first, but then they put me into the intelligence thing, which is stupid. And thank God they didn't use me. So that, that's all I can remember. Do you remember the men being somewhat scared before going in? Or were they were we scared? Yes. There's no question we were scared, but we just put that out of our mind and and just did everything within our power to just do what we had to do and hopefully survive and most of us survived could you describe to me your first combat experience my first i'm trying i don't know if i could i could really do that my first it's a good question but Not really, I can't, I can't like see that. That's all right. Um, <laughs> I did a bit of research and I realized you guys were in Bastogne at the time. In Bastogne? Bastogne. I, I don't remember being in Bastogne. <laughs> um, well, could you tell me a bit about what it was like, your surroundings there, where you were situated? I went with the surroundings, yeah. but we didn't stay still. We were on the move all the time. Okay. So it was going through different towns, and and and, and you know, in, in different cities and so on. And do you remember Christmas of that year? Do I remember Christmas? Did you say? Yes, of that of that year when you were in France. Do you, like, could you tell me a bit about uh, how you celebrated Christmas that year while you were in France? Oh. Well, I never celebrated Christmas because I'm Jewish. And oh, okay. But, uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, we, we were lucky sometimes we got a little extra rations or a little extra something. But the food wasn't a problem. We, we had enough to eat, and of course, we had, we had this, uh, these metal plates and covers that we would travel with, and sometimes where we stopped, they had food to them, give us. You, you went in the line, and they put the food in your metal can, and you had some forks and knives, and you ate, and you had enough to eat. That wasn't the problem. You always, they always seemed to have food for us. And do you remember any specific stories about Europe that you could tell me? Well, but. I can tell you a sad one. Uh, the war was just about over. And uh, we were in this town in Germany, and a chaplain came to me. We didn't, they didn't have a rabbi, uh, and he gave me the news. That my brother was killed. That my brother was killed. Boy. There was a house on top of the hill, a mansion. I went up to that mansion. I broke everything in that house. I mean, whoever had that mansion didn't have a mansion anymore. 
and to make me feel good, <clears throat> my my company. <laughs> had me go to the hospital to take two dead Germans out and have them buried. Hooray. So I, I buried two Germans. Okay, they meant well. Yeah, that was tough. That was painful. Hmm. He was tough, my brother. He was, he was a fighting Jew. They called him. What was okay. his name? What's that? What was your brother's name? Bernard. Lieutenant Bernard Leon Horowitz. He was a lieutenant. And were you around the same age? Uh, he was two and a half years older. I was, I was younger. Do you feel that being Jewish, you felt more scared to be captured, or did you feel more hate towards the Germans? What did that change anything? The answer is let me answer that. On your dog tags, there was an H in a corner for Hebrew. They told us if you get captured by the Germans, throw away your dog tags because they see the H, they'll kill you. Knowing you're Jewish rather than take you as a prisoner. You understand what I mean? Yes, I do. Okay. And did you feel any more hate towards the Germans, or...? I, I had enough hate. I didn't need more or less. I had enough hate. They were killing Jewish people all over the world. For what? And the Polish I hate for building those cook camps. You know, those are two countries right now, Poland and Germany. I hate them, hate those countries. I'll never stop hating them. But in Poland, they built these cook places where they had the Jews go in and incinerate us and kill them, and burn them. How a, how a cut, how a, Human beings can do that to other human beings. And if you try to stop them, they would shoot you and so on. Yeah, so that's two countries to this day, Poland and Germany, and my kids know this. Hate them, hate them, and hate them for good reason. Okay, next. Hmm. Um, well, could you tell me, do you have any stories from your fighting in Europe that you could tell me? Fighting stories? Well, or just tell me about what combat was like for you. And well, it was, I was in more or less towards the end. So it was more mopping up than real tough combat. So I was very lucky. My brother wasn't, I was. So it was more mopping up. And there'd be snipers and, you know, and one nice guy got killed by a sniper. I loved to be a nice young man. I feel badly when I think of him. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so that was just mopping up, going through, and... Then I ended up in Austria, <clears throat> and uh, that's where I got uh, amoebic dysentery, <laughs> and, and uh, just below where I was was Berchtesgaden, where Hitler was <clears throat> encamped. <laughs> Yes. Yes, please. One minute, a little water. Of course. All right. Yeah, so I ended up with the amoeba, the 
was in terror, but I survived, of course. And But I was not far from Berkner's Garden, where allegedly Hitler met they so he may have burned in there to death, but I don't know. Hmm. And do you have any stories that you could tell me about your your time in Europe? My time in Europe. Yes, just uh, during during the war. But for, as I'm saying, mainly the war was pretty much over, and and we just went through the towns, and and Isaac has a whole map of where I was and uh, I get, he has a map of everything where my company was and where where we marched and every all the towns that we mopped up so to speak um, do you have any funny stories to tell maybe or any any interesting um, I'm trying to think of, I mean, when you say goodbye to me, probably a bunch of stories will come to me. <laughs> and, uh, hold it. One minute, young man. You know, I'm not so young. You know how old I am. Oh, Don't yeah. you? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, so it's a it's an incredible honor to be speaking with you and a privilege, uh, I must say. Um, Thank you. Well, I, I'd like to ask you about after the war. Um, you had to process many German prisoners, right? Yeah, we had a lot of German prisoners. Could you tell me anything about that? I'm thinking now. I don't know what I had to do with the prisoners. We kept that was a, not my department. So uh, they was they were kept somewhere. Should have killed them all. All right. No, I I don't. I didn't have, I didn't take care of the prisoners. Okay. Um, and could you tell me about the end of the war when, when it, like, when Germany surrendered, do you recall that? Oh, yeah, I sure do. <laughs> May 8th, May 15th, right? Yes. Right? And May 8th, my brother got killed. He was a tank commander. <clears throat> and he, he, he had a battalion of tanks that he commanded. He was, had a terrific, he, was, he had three Purple Hearts. He was in the hospital once, and he had a bandage on. So he took the bandage off and ran out of the hospital. Because if he kept it on, they would not have let him out. But this way they thought it was a visit. So, so, yeah. So, no, I have no, no most, ask me, ask me. I don't I have nothing more to say there. Hmm. Do you remember any celebrations or what was your, what was it like? No celebrations. Wow. You know, we, we didn't drink much whiskey. Uh, we never did in my family, and, uh, for whatever reason. So, but uh, we were just, it was jumping up and down, I'm trying to think. I, I don't remember any more than just jumping up and down and, and hugging each other and, and so on. Um, and so what happened afterwards could, could you tell me what, afterwards in, while I was in the army 
Whatever. No, what, what happened after you, the war ended in Europe? You went back to the U.S., right? I went to where? To the U.S. again. Yeah, I went back to the United States. Yeah. And what, what did he do when you got back? Uh, what did he retrain? Uh, were, I was going to get getting dismissed. Hmm. And Sorry. yes, so you had to t- turn your uniform. No, you didn't have to turn your uniform. You just had to stand in line and get stamped, dismissed, and so on. Hmm. And they would take a urine sample to see if you were right. And I couldn't pee. So I had the guy next to me pee in my cup. <laughs> um, and did you ship to the Pacific Theater? Oh, well, after the war already, they didn't know what to do with us. So they sent us to the Philippine Islands. There was nothing doing there. There was no water. But it was a lovely boat trip. Uh, it was we had, were on a ship, and it was a slow ride on the water. It was so relaxing. It was vacation. This after that, there was just vacation. <laughs> Philippine Islands. And that's where it, we, we had slept in a tent. Gordon Collins, Stoiber, the, the intelligence group, and it, there's where we did a lot of drinking, including me. And throwing up. <laughs> and but, the, but that stopped after a while, you know. But Collins drank a lot, even all the time. Anyway, that's beside the point. What did you think of the Pacific Islanders? And then, uh, uh, the Philippines, they were nice people. They were happy we were there because we were spending money. And so it was, it was really a, a vacation. Uh, it was, I was no longer a soldier. Hmm. And did you meet any people that had fought in the Pacific um, while you were there? Did I meet any of those uh, civilians there? Or soldiers? No. Soldiers. That had no. fought there? No, no not, nothing special. Um, we would play baseball. It was, it was a waste of time. I mean, it was spending money for nothing. Okay. And when the Japanese officially surrendered, how did he celebrate then? Uh, when the... I, you know, I... I when the Japanese... That was after the atom bomb. Yes. By the way, to me, the atom bomb saved more Japanese lives than without the atom bomb. Now, why do I say that? <clears throat> because the emperor in Japan said to the families, you must be prepared to fight until everyone is dead. Now, this is in the Japanese Peace uh, Museum in Japan. This is what I just said, quoting him. So the Japanese people, families, were going to fight till everyone in the family was dead. So the atom bomb came, and that stopped the whole thing. Yes. More Japanese would be dead if not for the atom bomb. And more Americans would be dead if not for the atom bomb. Because they were sending me over to Japan at that point. I had a furlough, and then I was ready to get onto a boat to go to Japan. So that saved my life, too. Because the Japanese fought to lay the all died. They didn't ever surrender. So the atom bomb saved a lot of Japanese lives and mine too. And did you think the 
Well, as you know, there were two atom bombs dropped. Yeah, the second one I don't understand. And you don't think the second one should have been dropped? I never understand why it was dropped, no. Hmm. Um, and was there a lot of uh, fear about having to invade Japan? Did everybody know that they were there for that reason? Did they know there was a reason? Well, I, they, did they know that they had to invade Japan, like you and your fellow soldiers at the time? We knew that Japan was next, yes. Yes. They, I was, they were getting me ready. How did they get you ready for that? Well, they gave me a furlough at home. And then I just... Regular uniform and rifle. No special... Anything. But thank God I never had to go. And... Could you tell me about reuniting with your family after the war ended? Uh, after I was dismissed? Yeah. You know, my, my father, before I was, he tried hard to so that they would not send me to Japan. He... He uh, had letters. He said one brother was killed. Don't send him overseas. They tried always for me not to go overseas again. That's interesting. All right. So how did I feel after the war? Was asked that question again. After the war was over. Well, after when when you met your family, like I saw them after the war. Where I when I was dismissed. Yes. When, yeah. All right. I was happy but depressed because the question was why him not me meaning my brother why was he killed not me so I was depressed afterwards and uh, my father was I was lived, my father lived with his wife, his second or third wife, I don't know. And I, I was, they had no room for me, but I lived there. But then I had a, a very nice cousin, a lawyer, Abe. He was always nice beforehand. We used to, what well, before the war, he used to, we used to go bowling. We used to have, and he was a lawyer, a very nice guy. And he came to me and he said, he saved my life. He said, you know where the old Hebrew war for the asylum was? They have soldiers living there now. Why don't you go there and apply to live there? So I got out of my father's house, I went over there, and my life started. Because I got a lovely room, I shared it with somebody, and there were old soldiers who were there living there. And we had nice, we didn't have food. I ate peanut butter jam for ages because we didn't have money. But I was happy. And, and uh, so, so that was good living in the army home. And we would change, living with someone, you would sometimes, you would change the guy you were living with sometimes and get, get someone else. And whatever. But my life opened up there. I, what work did he go into? Or did what? He, what job did he get after the war? My father had a paper business, selling paper bags to grocery stores. He had his own business. He was very brilliant, my father. He, he, 
you know, we had jobs for everyone in the family. But so he had a main big business where he bought carloads of these bags and then I would sell them in groceries, butcher shops to paper and all that. And I'd get commission that way. Hmm. And that was good. And did he go to college? What? Did he ever go to college? Well, the truth is, I did, but uh, I went to city college. But I couldn't study. I would sit in a classroom and my mind was too upset with what I went through. It was my brother dying. So I sat in a college room in the classes. I got D in everything. <laughs> because I got D and NS. I don't, I don't know. So I didn't get educated. But mm. I, I did very well anyway. <laughs> Without Good. an education. Um, well, this question goes back a bit. Um, I know that you earned the bronze star. A bronze star, yeah. Yes. Could you tell me about how you earned it? I don't think I did anything for it. I don't. I have it, but I. I think they just gave it. I don't know. I don't. I don't think I did anything special. No. Well, but I could you tell me what I, you did do? Sorry. For I didn't do anything special. No. But I've got it. It's in my office here. Mm. And it's my name. So I don't know why they gave it. But I didn't do anything. My brother has a bronze star that, that he has three purple eyes. Mm. But not me. So they gave... So what What did he... Did he do anything? Or like, even if you don't consider it to be special. Oh. What what was the, the reason for it being awarded to you? I don't know. You, okay. I don't know. Huh. Interesting. Um, well, I'll ask you some questions that are not... Well, I'll ask you a few questions now that are not really specific to, to combat or anything. Um, but how did your perception of war change? It's the same as it is now. The human being has to have war. If you go back, there's been war, 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 war. Why? don't know why, but uh, this never seems to be a war that ends all wars, right? Okay, I'm okay now. I don't know. I don't know why there's always wars, but there always are. And... Did your perception... You went to school. There, there were wars all along. Civil war, this war. Yes. Um, and did... Even in America, the South had to fight the North, and the North had to fight the South. Why, why could we settle things without killing each other? Well, that would be fun. There's no war. All right, next. How did the war change you as a person? Just think about the beginning before you enlisted and now. Well, the answer is I, I was a kid. I was so young. So was it the war or was just everything about me? The war and just getting older. And then so... It much matured me. In what way? I don't know. I, I just, I guess I never thought about that. 
but it, it had to uh, make me a little bit older than I really was. Mm-hmm. It had to. That's all. But nothing. I, di- I didn't go around sad or, or anything. But when I was in Army Hall, I was enjoying life. And then I met Miriam. How did he meet Mary? Okay, how did I meet no, no. A friend. Uh, a friend uh, that Miriam had or something had made a party for four people. She had a, a Shirley, Miriam, Clark, and something else. And I got Shirley, and and Clark got Miriam. Now Clark was a wild guy, and we named Carol after. Him. So I got the woman I didn't care about, and Clark said, "Hey, hey I'm giving you Miriam." <laughs> so that's how I got Miriam. <laughs> and when was this? It was in seventy seven years ago. <laughs> seventy seven years ago. Okay. Thank you. And how long were you married to Marion? How long was I married? Yes. Seventy seven years. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. that's that's incredible. Yeah, and she died when she was ninety-five. Well, she had a stroke. And what, at your age right now, at ninety-nine years old, what do you value most about life? What do I what? Value most about life. What you what, what do you value most about life? About what do I value most about life? Yes. It's an interesting question. The fact that life gave me the ability to build a family. I'm a big word, fair person for the word family. It gave me the opportunity to build a family, and and I we're close, we're good together, and as I always told them, there's a plus and a minus. Sometimes the minus is there. Press the plus button, and so on. But having a nice family. Having a, like, I have a daughter I spoke to today. It was her anniversary, 20 years married. I, I, I have a son in California. Really, really if, if, I, if I got sick two minutes, he'd be here. I mean, when Miriam was sick, he was here, stayed upstairs. And came down every time to anything she needed, he took care of it. So we're a good family. And that's very important, that I feel. Yes. That if you're alive, alive. And Mano, I have a woman here, 24-7, and she knows me very well. I said, when you can give, you're a lucky person. When you can give to somebody and she knows I give plenty to people to help them and and so 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 that's my pleasure in life to have a good family and that I have the ability to give and I'm happy to do hmm. next um, now, I'm not such a nice guy <laughs> Um, well, the next question would be, what does the American flag represent to you? 
What does what? The American flag represent to you. The American flag. American life? Flag. Flag. Uh, the American flag. What does it represent to you? The American flag? Yes, yes. I, I don't go crazy about flags. I mean, because I've seen rotten people use the American flag. So I, I, I don't react to the flag because it's uh, used not nicely. And so I don't like to use the flag for anything. Well, I, I believe in action. To restructure that question, I'd say, what does America as a symbol mean to you? Um, what does America what? Mean to you as, as a country? for America. I think it still is the best country. I mean, Belgium is very good too. So, Belgium's very good. I have clients over there, a client over there. She just moved there. Lovely woman. And her husband. Black man. But brilliant. So, uh, you said a uh, client. Do you do you still work or? Uh, oh, me. Yes. I... No, I don't work anymore. But I have in my I have an office with all my clients and what they have. But I don't do anything. I just I see it and I see what my kids have and my Michael and my even mine. I have a nice account. I taught her about investing. It's she appreciates that. Hmm. Um, well, one, another question for you would be, um, do you have any advice for future and our current generation that you would like to, to give? Advice for a teacher? For, no, for, for our generation. For a generation? For, for my generation and future generations. Negotiating. Don't use war to solve problems. Hmm. Do not use war to solve problems. Just keep trying to negotiate. Thank you. Okay. Well, I... are we almost finished? Yes, you know, well, I'm 99. How long am I going to live here? <laughs> I think that, that, that was my final question for you today.